Western Library is located in Louisville, Kentucky. We sit at 604 South 10th Street. Um, this is the first African-American library in the nation, ran by a completely African-American staff. Um, Reverend Thomas Fountain Blue was the head librarian. Rachel Harris was the children's librarian. And this building was, this library was created to help African-Americans have a place to go to read because you, they couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't go to the main library. Um, like, like today we can go to every library in the city, but before we could not do that. So they, this is why it was created to make sure for the betterment of African-Americans to have a place to read for children to learn, you know, have a love of books and things like that. It started originally in a house at 1125 West Chestnut, just right down the street. The house is no longer there. Um, and it was three rooms of the house. Um, Reverend Blue um, was a man far ahead of his time because he created a curriculum for checking out books, um, how they should be categorized and different things like that for many of the things, the policies and things that we're using today, he created back then at that time for how long a book should be checked out, how do you keep a record of who's checked out the books and things of that nature. Um, the building was created through Albert Mazik was one of the, the leading educators at the time that fought to get the petition started to have this built. He was a principal at Central High School um, during that time and he led the charge to have that done um, with the petition and the different things that they have. Reverend Blue uh, was a preacher. He was not a trained librarian. And so while being in this building, him and Rachel Harris decided to create a library school for African-Americans to come from all over to train in this building to be a librarian because there was no place that African-Americans could go to, to be trained, to know what it's like to, what, what should you really do in a library as far as checking out books and the collection and you know what you should have, the things like that, the things that um, we know today, they didn't know what to do with that back then um, to set that kind of curriculum in, in place. But um, we have a historical uh, mural on the, our wall in our meeting room that talks about all the various um, phases that this has gone through, the things that have happened in this area. Um, the Western Library sits in the Russell neighborhood. Uh, which is a historical African-American neighborhood. It was um, named after Harvey Russell. And um, we have a lot of diversity now where before we did not, this is a predominantly black or African-American neighborhood. We have a lot of um, buildings around us, housing projects um, that are around us where a lot of our children and things like that come in. At that time, there were more houses to where now there's more of affordable living um, for patrons to come in into the library. Um, but is it, this is a, still a predominantly, even though it's more diverse today than it used to be, it's still a more predominantly African-American neighborhood. So our patrons have become more diverse over time in the time that I've been here as the manager. Um, I've been here to be four years this March as the manager and we have made sure, or I have definitely made sure that we do programming and things that speak to the community to make sure that we're highlighting the things that are needed. I wanted to make sure that I took it back to the core values that Reverend Blue had, which was making sure that you're serving your community and the things that you know that they need. Um, so I really wanted to make sure, I think I set of the box with any kind of programming and things that we do that we are catering and meeting, meeting a need, not just a book, but you know what other needs do you have? We have tutors that come here um, from the University of Louisville Writing Center that comes in and tutors um, in reading and writing, helps with homework. It began with just doing children. It has now grown to also include adults. So they also now just, not just help them with um, writing, but tutor them also as well in, in reading. So I wanted to make sure that this kind of got back to being a more like, a, I guess you could say in a way, it's more like a community center 
um, as well as a library, because we make sure that we're we're trying to remove all access barriers. Any any barrier to access of information or needs, anything that we can help within our parameters of what we can do, I try to make sure that we find a way to do it. If we don't have it, I try to make sure that we find it to put that out there for people. Interacting with um, that particular area at different times, safety is a concern uh, for many people. And I've seen numerous times accounts where children and families alike the library is more than just a source of information for education or even using the computer for technology. It's a safe place before safe place. What's a safe place, right? Exactly. Where you have that earmark, uh, people come in for refuge in a way. Um, do you believe that over time, since you've been branch manager, do you see particular times of the year where there's an influx? I mean, I would assume summer that there would be more interactions but that's not always the case, depending upon what's the redevelopment or what's going on in the neighborhood. Is it pretty consistent with people coming in just to honestly get off the street and find some safe place to relax? It's consistent year round. There's, I mean, obviously in the summer, we see our kids a lot more because, you know, they're not in school. Um, if they don't go stay with a relative or go visit somewhere or go on vacation during the summer, then they're in here. Um, but even with just adults as well, you know, this is, this is definitely a safe place. Like you said, it's a safe place before there was a safe place. Um, but they come, you know, to, especially in this cold weather to warm up. see what the need, the needs, the ongoing needs, because it's not as if needs just are um, finite, right? Like only one thing, find that one thing and tick, check it off the box. Like it's always evolving because people are changing and growing and the needs shift and you're willing to be flexible enough to allow the branch to move and flow with the people and their needs. Um, one of the known needs in particularly that area of the Russell neighborhood is the food food desert. So do you want to speak on any types of components that the library has been integral in trying to make sure that needs are met with either resource information, dealing with food justice? So when we, we have had multiple patrons come in and ask, um, anytime somebody comes in, they're looking for a resource, we're going to look to see what we can find and find what's in the community um, close to where they live. So they have easier access to it. They don't have to, I mean, obviously if you live in Russell, I don't want you to have to travel all the way to Middletown, way across the city just to, to meet a need and get the services that you need. Um, but also if there's something that we can provide, like obviously we can't really provide food, but I can also partner with somebody that could possibly bring in food. So we have partnered with JCPS where they have a program during the summer where they come out um, with the bus and they bring lunches to kids. Every day at a certain time, they would come and bring bring food and we would provide a space. We would have a program during that time where the kids could come and sit and eat their little box lunches and, you know, take part in an art program or something of that nature. Whenever we have our game times, we provide snacks. Any Usually any programs that we have, if we're able to, we provide snacks to make sure that they have that. But also um, we have a block party. Um, whenever we have a block party during the summer, I always make sure that we have, you know, resources to not just give away free books so that they have books to take home, but also resources for dentists um, where they can get toothpaste and toothbrushes and have contacts through that, all kinds of free access to healthcare services where they can ask questions where maybe they would not have access to that normally, but also food. So if there's somebody who wants to partner, they come in and everything that's there is completely free, but it's not just a one, I wanna make it a, where it's like a one-stop shop, but it's not just on that particular day. So they know where the, they met the people, they know where they can go in the future to also get those services. It's not just the children, it's also the adults. You know, what is it that I can help you with in some kind of way? You know, we do computer appointments, resume appointments and help. Um, 
where they don't know how to even use a computer, you know, and now when you apply for a job, you have to do everything online. So, you know, I don't know how to type. How, to, how can I learn how to type? Well, let me show you where to go in on the computer and get a free typing class. You know, you don't have to pay people to do stuff like that. You can sit there and just take your time and do it. And there's no rush, you know, take your time with it. So it's definitely been a refuge in many, many ways. We've had many um, older adults come in applying for a job online for the first time and working with them and doing that. And once they, they get it and they uh, fill out the application and they're working with it and they come back and they, they always make sure they come back and let us know that they got the job and they were so excited that they learned how to use the computer to do some of that stuff. So um, those, are, those are the things that for me, for one, keeps me going because I know we're providing that need that's not, that hasn't been met and making sure that we're providing that refuge and that comfort, whatever the level of it is, whatever the, the, the depth of it is, trying to meet it as the best as we can. Right, there's intergenerational and there's intercultural to make sure that all people are welcome, no matter what the backdrop is. And I would consider what you're saying to be a very holistic approach that welcomes everyone. Um, however, because it's a historically African-American facility right before it was the library, it was the colored school. Because of that, do you find when people interact that are entrenched in the library, do they, is there a civic pride? Is there a, a pride that comes along with knowing that, hey, this was created by people that look just like me with that representation? Is that really intact or do they just not know necessarily the history? They don't know the history. And I guess for me, especially growing up locally, um, it's not taught. It's not taught anywhere. And it's probably not taught because the teachers don't even know. You know, it's, it's like we're the most well-kept secret in <laughs> that we may be known nationally, but being known locally is kind of hard. Um, a lot of people don't know that history. So I make it a point that, especially our kids, our youth, when they come in, explaining that to them. And once they, they learn about it, then that sense of pride comes, um, you know, because this is all they have right here. You know, there's not many things to do in this particular area. So they learned, you know, that, oh, I've got something special that nobody else has in the city. When I go to school and they're talking about their library, I've got something more important than their, you know, I've heard all kinds of conversations from my kids where they're going somewhere and bragging once they've learned the history. As long as they, <laughs> they don't try to get in an argument with anybody about whose library is better than the other one, because we're all trying to serve the community, but we do have that special touch here because it is historical, but it's not well known. It's not well known at all, um, which is something that I've worked very, very hard to try to change in my time of being here is getting the word out and reminding people that, you know, to listen to your elders that are telling you these stories about this library that they grew up in, that is, you know, what they're telling you is, is basically the gospel. This was, this was the place back in the day. And, you know, I'm trying to make sure that we get that word out there so that, that people will cherish it a little bit more now, too about the land and the people. What would you consider to be one issue that just strikes you as one of the strongest or the most significant challenges that the land that you are surrounded by within the branch is facing? And then also one tidbit, of course, the historical context of the library, but outside of that, one part of Louisville the land component that you really feel like should be um, championed more. So one problematic issue with the land and people, the interactions between the two, and then also one that you can find a lot of victories in that people may not even know about. The challenge I would say is that people don't wanna come west of 9th Street. They're afraid to come into the West End. And we're literally one block away from 9th Street. People will go into the downtown area, but they don't want to come into the West End. They don't want to come. They, if there's this, this um, myth about, oh, something bad is going to happen to you if you go past 9th Street. Oh, don't do that. And that's not the case. 
you know, one of the, the biggest things that I have seen and I know from I was born and raised and still live in the West End of Louisville. Um, so this is my community. This is this is my heart and soul. And that's why I pour myself into this community the way that I do as the manager here is that people often think that because you live in the West End or you live west of 9th Street, that you're uneducated, that, oh, something bad is going to happen to you, that there's only bad people down there. There's, you know, be careful, watch your purse and all those different types of things. And I see it in my kids. You know, the kids, when they come in here, and I call them my kids because I feel like they're my kids. They've pretty much argued over if I'm their library, whose library mama I am. So, um I see them, I see the hurt in their face and in their eyes when they talk to me about how the kids will talk about where they live at, how they'll never amount to anything and things like that. And I know if the children are feeling that, the adults are feeling it when they're applying for jobs or anything like that, because there is this, this whole veil, this, this cloud that lives over the head of those who live in the West End and live in Russell or, you know, anything like that. So... I always try to instill in, my, in the kids when they come in and tell them, people will say what they're gonna say, but you are the deciding factor. Who you will become, what you will do is totally up to you. It does, it's not based on where you live. It's not based on any of that kind of stuff. What the, what's out there and what you become is what you put into it. And if there's anything that I can help you to do to help you get to that level, that I can do, I'll do everything in my power, you know, um, to make sure that you succeed. Don't think that just because, you know, you live right here in City View or live in Beecher Terrace that um, it's a bad thing. You know, it's, it's, but that's the, the, the people problem, you know, that you're looked down upon because you live here. Working here at this branch, it's been hard. It's been a lot of turnover at this particular location because people were afraid to work here. Um, they're, they use it as a stepping stone to get a promotion and go someplace else. So I'm sure if that was like that for this, for this library, it's like that for businesses that are trying to set up in the, in the West End, that's the problematic thing. You know, how are you, how can you be successful if nobody will come to you, you know, or you, nobody wants to come and work at your location because of where you're located kind of thing. So pushing past that is just, People just have to to get past that. How do you get past it? Well, it's, it's not an easy task to try to get past that thing. That's been probably one of the biggest challenges that I have seen being here and listening to people confide in me the struggles that they have gone through. I know I have family members and I've been through it myself. Um, you know, going to college and, and doing different things, people don't, they don't, the, the thing that has been said to me is, oh, I didn't know people in the West didn't go to college. I didn't, it's like, well, why wouldn't we? <laughs> you know, um, and it's not, it wasn't even really based on being white or black. It was just based on because of where you live, you know, the land. Um, and it's far more, far more than what people give it credit for. And, you know, it's no different than any place else in the city of Louisville. You know, it just it just has that cloud that needs to be lifted. Because like, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't be down here. Maybe it is really that bad. If we all run, who's going to change it? If we don't stay and be that catalyst for change, how does that happen? Same as I tell my, if I'm, I have to basically practice what I preach. If I'm telling my kids, don't let where you live at dictate what you become in life, then I can't, I have to walk in that and say, well, you know, I live in the West End and I'm not going to toot my own horn. I've gone to college. I'm the manager of this branch. I'm trying to help people. I'm trying to give back. I'm trying to be that catalyst for change because if I don't do it, who's going to do it? You know, I, I have to show them as well as I'm telling them that I'm, I'm walking that walk, that how important that is to make sure that, you know, you see, you help people to see it a different light. You know, I can say that I've definitely been blessed in the fact that now I have a staff that is um, whenever I hire somebody or I talk to somebody about it, one of my biggest things is community. If we do programming, uh, we do programming with a purpose. You know, what, what are we doing a program for? Who are we trying to reach? Who are we trying to serve? What do we get out of that? What does the community get out of that? How do we change the community? How do we have uncomfortable conversations respectfully? 
and do programs. We've had programs here on diversity and inclusion. We've had programs here on racism. We've had programs on different myths that are that are found in the black family. How do we get past those types of stereotypes and do different things? Because sometimes, you know, we have to face ourselves, right? You know, if we're gonna get where we need to be and be progressive, we have to kind of get past some of that stuff. Um, but at the exact same time, we'll do, I've done programs on Beach of Terrace. I'm a consulting party for the redevelopment that's taking place over there. So one of the things that I wanted to do was talk about, okay, I'm, it's great that I'm hearing all these different things that are happening, but I want everybody to have access to this information too. And I want them to be able to ask you the same questions I'm asking you, you know, because everybody should know what's going on. So we've done Visions of Beach of Terrace, giving everybody the, the opportunity to ask those uncomfortable questions and put them in the hot seat and have them respectfully um, because that's the only way we remove any kind of a stigma that's over the people and the land in this area. Queries, right? They have curiosity. Those can be met with empowering them to ask those questions, even if they're hard questions, right? Like to respectfully ask those mm -hmm. questions to get answers that are gonna impact their lives directly, which kind of segues mm -hmm. into the positive Right, like one of the positive earmarks that I keep hearing is we're more than just a stereotype, we're more than just a stigma. I've encountered, interacted, collaborated with, worked with so many brilliant, intelligent, talented, beautiful people that reside, work, and live and play rest of night. Mm -hmm. And so, to speak to that component, there's genius there, there's doctors there, there's lawyers there, there's teachers there, there's librarians there. I mean, it's not as if all of the good stops at once of night and there's this little meter and it just ticks downward. Like that's not necessarily the case. Right. Um, if you could just, I guess, sum it up and tell people because we understand the challenges and we see that there's a lot of positive that is overlooked to say the least, more than often it's, it's overlooked. How could an organization or a person with really no ties to Louisville will come in and truly invest in the people. Not just for dollars. Dollars are cool, but dollars run out. How can they truly invest in the people? I would say that you have to emerge yourself in the community. You need to listen to what the community is saying that they need. Don't assume and it's like, you know, yes, this is a food desert. And we're like, well, they need this type of a grocery store, but do they need that type of, what, you know, what are the needs in the store? You know, what are you serving? If you're, let's say you put a store in here and all you have is junk food. Well, that's not going to serve anybody any purpose. Where's the healthy food at? You know, you need to make sure that you're nurturing the community that you're trying to put something in. You know, um, one of the things that I live by, as I call it, the three E's is encouragement. Um, empowerment is encouragement that is everlasting. That's my three E's. You know, if you empower people, you encourage them and it lasts. It's everlasting, right? So if you're going to come in and you're going to empower a community, you need to make sure that you're listening to what that community's needs are. Meet them where they are. How do we get to the next level? Let them tell you, don't tell them where they need to go. Let them tell you what they want and where they need to go. One of my biggest things is being here as the manager is listening to the community. You know, I'm a member of this community, so I know personally, you know, what some of the things were that we were missing the mark on, but what else is it that I'm missing? Because I'm not all over the West End. You know, I've got one mile in the corner that I'm in, but what's happening in the rest of the West End? Because where one area of the West End is not the same as the next. So it's just making sure that if we're going to make it positive change, that we're doing it with the work of everybody involved, not assuming what everybody needs, but actually working and listening to what the needs are and meeting, meeting everybody where they are and moving it to the next level. That's, that's been one of my, my biggest things is making sure that we're listening. You know, we don't do typical library programming. We're not going to sit here and, and make some hanging flower pots and, you know, different things like it's great. I can still do it. But what else is it? What am I missing? Because it is hard to get people to come here for a program because 
we're west of 9th Street, even though we're just at one block. They don't want to come here, but what can I do that's going to encourage people to come? And it's not just encourage people to come west of 9th Street, but encourage people from the west of the West End to come to me. You know, what, what is it that I need? What is it that you need? How can I speak to you? How can I offer you something and help you in some kind of way and let you know that we're here for you? You know, how do I put out that positive change and making sure that we're encouraging and empowering um, the community at large? That's that's the biggest way, I think, to make that positive change is you have to empower your community. You can't dictate to them what they need. You need to empower them to, to get that encouragement to move on.